this version is way from creation. So vegan word. So needs power, let me tell you, say a word. So needs power, let me tell you, say a word. Make a move and don't say a word. Have you heard? Well, listen to this word. So needs power, let me tell you, say a word. So and power, let me tell you, say a word. You have the power, now you heard. Make a move and don't say a word. Have you heard? There were two punishment cells created in this uh, slave castle by the British to keep the African captives who fought for their freedom. We will see these punishment cells. From there, we will move out of what we call the door of no return, the exit to the slave ships. I will start with the, the Portuguese. The, the Portuguese, they were the first Europeans to have arrived on the shores of present day Ghana. In the 1400s, the Portuguese started exploring the coast of West Africa, searching for gold. And around 1471, they arrived on the shores of present-day Ghana. Uh, when the Portuguese came, they, they found the gold. The Africans they met uh, were already mining and trading in gold. So these Portuguese uh, decided to stay so that they can basically take as much gold away mm -hmm. as possible. Mm -hmm. 11 years after the Portuguese arrived, around 1482, they acquired a piece of land in a town not far from here known as Elmina. And over there, the Portuguese built a trading fort. They were using the fort initially as a transit point to take the gold to Portugal. But in the early 1500s, the Portuguese started taking Africans mm. to Brazil, enslaving these Africans on the sugarcane plantations there. When the Portuguese started taking Africa, they were kidnapping people randomly, you know, in the villages, in the farms, and all that. But they, they saw that it was not sustainable, and it was a problem, because the Africans in these communities were fighting back, their families and people were being kidnapped and taken away. So the Portuguese thought of you know, finding a different way in getting Africans to take them to Brazil. Having come to West Africa, they saw that uh, we were divided along the kingdoms and states. There were different kingdoms, different states, and there were wars of expansion between these kingdoms. During these wars, prisoners of wars were taken. Of course. And used in societies as, as servants, in the homes, in the military. Uh, even some prisoners uh, of war rose up to become, uh, you know, kings or chiefs in the very societies that took them as prisoners of war. So the Portuguese took advantage of what was happening. They started introducing guns and gunpowder. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with the guns and gunpowder, the kingdoms became more powerful. You know, uh, the wars intensified. And what the Portuguese were asking in exchange for the guns and gunpowder they were giving out was the prisoners of wars mm. Mm -hmm. that were taken and originally used in societies as servants. So gradually, the Portuguese succeeded in getting some African kings to uh, start collaborating with them, bringing them prisoners of war, and they giving out the guns and gunpowder in exchange. Uh, but one thing, while all that was going on, the Portuguese, they were still kidnapping people. Of For about a hundred years, these Portuguese basically held a monopoly over the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. But by the end of the 16th century, other Europeans started competing with them. The Dutch, the Danish, the French, you know, the Swedish, all of them, the British, they were in West Africa, taking not only the natural resources, but also the, the resources. Africans, the human. This uh, slave castle, the Cape Coast slave castle, 
started as a very small fort, the Swedish. They were the first Europeans to have built on the land. Around 1654, the Swedish had a small fort built. The land was leased to the Swedish for some years by the kings or the chiefs in the town. Uh, the Swedish, they were using the fort they built to just take gold to Sweden. But then the fort changed hands between three other European countries. The Danish captured the fort from the Swedish mm. around 1658. Three years later, in 1661, the Dutch also came around. They drove the Danish away and occupied the same fort. Mm. The Dutch stayed for just four years. In 1665, the British fought the Dutch here, defeated them. And the British were the ones who then expanded or developed the fort into what we see now, the slave castle. It took the British more than 100 years to develop the structure into how it is now. And they did wow. use Africans, forced labor, to build it up. And for close to 200 years, they took many Africans from here to British colonies in the Americas and the Caribbean yes. to be enslaved there. And the Africans taken away by the British through this very slave castle, majority of them, they were taken or captured within present day Ghana. But in those days, there were some Africans captured in neighboring West African countries, Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, and brought down, marched down mm -hmm. to the slave castle. Mm -hmm. And many of these Africans, they were prisoners of the wars that was going on. There were many also who were kidnapped randomly from their homes. They are found by slave raiders. And these slave raiders were most times armed by the Europeans. Of course. You know, to raid the villages, the communities. And one thing, wherever the Africans were taken, they were marched on foot. They walk. Mm. You can imagine walking from even Accra. Mm -hmm. To, to Cape Coast, it's a long journey. Yes. Not, Im not to imagine walking from Burkina Faso. Yes. So there were many Africans who died yes. on the way. Yes. Mm -hmm. you no, know, those who survived the walk, mm -hmm. they were brought mm -hmm. to the slave castle. And the slave raiders, the middlemen, they brought the Africans here to auction them to the British. But then they did not auction them for money, it was the butter trade. The British here will use guns, textiles, other European commodities to butter, to exchange. And after getting all these Africans, the British branded them. They had branded irons with their companies' names or emblems carved sure. out at the tops, put into fire. Hey. The branding on the arm, they did this for, for easy identification. Yes. After the branding, they would then separate the Africans. As many as 1,000 men were kept in a male dungeon. And the female dungeons was holding about 400 women. In the dungeons, they kept the Africans for two weeks to as long as three months, waiting for the slave ships to arrive from Britain. In North America, uh, the British took the Africans to their colonies in the United States. Right. Uh, the Caribbean, to the lives of Jamaica, mm -hmm. Barbados, you know, Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And over there, they enslaved the Africans. They okay. used them as forced labor. Mm -hmm. the, the tobacco, the cotton, the sugarcane sugar plantations. Yes. In 1807, the British passed a law to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. But it is on record that there were many British along the shores of West Africa who did not stop taking right. Africans. No. They, they continued. Mm -hmm. taken away Africans until the 1860s when the British government began making effort to create colonies in West Africa so that they could be in control of the natural resources. Mm -hmm. So the British managed to create a colony and for another hundred years our gold, diamond, bauxite, all the resources were taking them away. Right. But in 1957, led by our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, right. we declared our independence mm -hmm. and changed the name from Gold Coast, which was given to us by these Europeans, mm -hmm. to Ghana. Yes. Yeah, to reflect, you know, 
uh, our Africans. That's right. And then Ghana, uh, it was an ancient empire. The Ghana Empire that covered much of present day Mali, mm -hmm. part of you know Burkina Faso, oh. Mauritania, and it was very rich in gold, very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghana, present day Ghana is very rich in gold also. Right. So when we wanted to take a name, we, we took the name Ghana, yeah, so to reflect you know our wealth, you know, and to reflect ourselves as Africans. Ghana has two uh, meanings. The name Ghana. Uh, the land of gold and then the warrior king. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to get an, an African said, name. For been there. So we are in the, the middle dungeon. One thousand Africans were kept in the space at the time. One thousand men. And what the British did was they divided the dungeon into chambers, five of them. Here's how that the place. This was how the place was yeah, in those days. Day and night. Maybe I saw those hundred men would be tight in this space, shackled together. Uh, there were a few wooden buckets placed at the corners for the men here to be them. But the buckets were not enough. And the few ones available, they were not even empty regulars. Most times, Tall and during the waist down on the floor. And the Africans were kept in it, they stayed. Uh, they were fed twice a day, morning, evening, the food put in the pumps. Mm -hmm. And for two weeks to three months, the British kept them in these conditions. Many Africans often became sick, of course, and they died. When one died, the body was taken out and thrown in the city. The British, they also established a church yes, in yeah. the slave castle, an English church. And the church was established right on top of this dungeon, just about the dungeon. Yeah. So whilst keeping the Africans uh, enslaved, they're praying on top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The floor, we see the bricks on the floor, but one thing, the floor has been excavated. On this small part, uh, you see what looks like a fresh soil, yes. but it is all decomposed human waste. Whoa! The feces, the, the food waste, the blood of the Africans over the years, you know, piling up this level, decaying and decomposing into what we see now. And this whole floor was just like this oh. until the 1970s. So they were the ones who excavated what they saw here to reveal the bricks. But they just left this small part untouched so that visitors could see for themselves. So the waste of the, yes, the waste of the ancestors. That is what we see right here. the dungeons, they fought for their freedom. Um, some tried organizing the others to rebel, to escape. And these freedom fighters, they were taken out of the dungeon and put in this uh, punishment cell. Now before the British put an African in, he is beaten quick. So he's taken in very quick. Uh, when, they, when they put the African in here, you know, uh, beaten, I mean, sure. brought in very weak, almost half dead. Mm -hmm. They had three doors fixed at the entrance of the cell. They would close all the three doors. This was a condemned cell. Yes. No food, no water, and no air in here. The African stays until he dies. So if it was a dead chamber, the idea was to kill, but to kill slowly, and painfully. Thou shalt not kill. The male condemned self. 
<laughs> and when the African dies, what the British do is they bring all the other male Africans out of the dungeon to sit at the court yeah the dead body is taken out for the others to see so they try to fear, put fear fear in the other men mm -hmm. to not rebel or to escape because this would be your fate exactly mm -hmm. so the freedom fighters they were put in the air and killed you know suffocated Slowly. to death the male condemned so oh. Our system where is that were built to store rainwater and they were using the rainwater to cook for the Africans they were keeping the dungeons. That was what they gave the Africans to drink as well. But now connected to the main water system in the town. The Europeans they were fighting among themselves. The British brought a cannon. Originally fixed on heels. They were mobile. The soldier fills one with gunpowder and then puts a cannonball at the mark and they light the match through a small opening. So the fire comes to contact with the gunpowder, it explodes. The pressure from the explosion moves the cannonball at top speed, very heavy. Fire to hit the enemy ship, break them on impact, create holes in them so that the water sinks. All here to be used in defending. Again, 200 men were kept in this very space. And what we see right here is a traditional shrine. A shrine that belongs to the local people who will live in the town. So the locals in the town who are traditionalists, they do come here to practice their religion, the African traditional uh, religion. And that is a priest in charge of the shrine. Now the, the shrine, it was built here long after the British had left. So during the slave trade, this shrine was not here. But one will ask, why was it built? Why is it here? It is here because of its historical and spiritual connection to the land on which this structure is built. The local history is that before these Europeans came, Mm -hmm. The ancestors, the Africans in the town, worshipped on the land. Uh, when the Swedish came, a piece of the land was leased to them to build, you know, uh, their structure. And the locals still used to come and worship. But then, when the land changed hands, when the Danish, Dutch, British all occupied the place, you know, they fortified the structure and did not allow the Africans to come and worship. The British were here until they left after our independence. Uh, after our independence, the locals in the town wanted a shrine back on the land. They wanted to come and worship on this sacred land. But this structure was here. And the government felt it was uh, you know, a histor historic structure. And so they couldn't just demolish it. So they negotiated or talked to the traditional priests, the priestesses, the locals, and agree that uh, they can have the shrine built in this chamber. So it is here because of its historical and spiritual connection to them. Behind this wall is an underground tunnel, a tunnel built by these British to connect the chamber to the sea about 70 meters long. And they were using the tunnel as a passage. During the slip trade, whenever the ships arrived at the shore, the Africans in the male dungeon, they were not taken out through the main door to the ships. The British soldiers rather uh, walked or forced the Africans through the tunnel, stole the shackles all the way to the shore. At the shore, they would force them into boats. The boats take them to the ships on the sea before they are moved to an unknown world. The Americans, the Caribbean, to be enslaved and never to return home to the motherland. <coughs> the British were the ones who closed the entrance to the tunnel around 1833, supposedly to symbolize the abolition of slavery in British colonies. When we continue out, I will show you parts of the underground Time. 
soldier here with a gun watching observing as the Africans are mm -hmm. marched mm -hmm. through. So starting from behind the shrine in shackles they moved up above the Africans. Mm -hmm. the yeah. These were store houses. Yeah. The goods they brought from Europe, the, the textiles and the acolyte grains and all that. And they did not, you know, take only the, the Africa. They stole also the natural resources. Okay. Female punishment cell. The dungeons in which the women were kept are down there. soon. But the women who resisted rape by the were not. And they could put as many as 10 women in this space. A woman could be kept in for about a week whilst in she eats once a day from the past. The idea to starve the woman to try and break her spirit. Well, the intention being that the next time she will be oh. submissive. Mm -hmm. so the African woman who, who said no. Who said no. He locked and starved the woman. 
the African Sudan. Let's see that just a step down. Two hundred women kept in this place. Two hundred women. The conditions the same as the male down. The waist, the toilet, urine, menstruation, everything down in here. And they kept the woman in the, in the waist. Two weeks to three months, the British kept them here. Many African women became sick and died. And when a woman dies, the body was carried out and thrown also into the ocean. That's it. Hmm. So they were treating the woman the same That's the mom. as a man. I now see that the door of no attack. But originally it was it was very small and narrow. So the Africans had to go through what mm -hmm. we call it a one time. Mm -hmm. it changed later into the big one. Now the name is very you know symbolic. Uh, these were people who were kidnapped, right? Taken from their homes, mm -hmm. their families. Mm -hmm. And forced here. No one came here with no one. Now, when these Africans were forced out of the door into the ships, they lost contact with them. That's right. They were sent to an unknown world. The Americas, the Caribbean, stripped of their freedom, their right. You know, they lost their name. The, the, the Europeans forced their names on them. Their land, their language, language their culture, religion, everything. Yes. The Africans were enslaved, used to profit the Europeans. That's right. And they did not return home to their mother. Bring the Africans out, walk them down, fall them in the small boat. Yeah. The ship stayed and all the, the boat moved them the ship. Yeah. Now in 1998, a ceremony was organized in this very uh, slave camp. Right. Uh, in the US and in Jamaica, the bones of two people were returned. Right. Uh, a Jamaican woman, her name is Madame Krista, mm -hmm. she has been buried in Christian, Jamaica. And an African American, the name is mm -hmm. buried in New York. The families are doing the remains of the grave. Brought, it, brought the remains down. The remains were brought to the slave castle on a boat. And then take it in, not through the main end, but through the same. That's right. And traditional funeral was held at a courtyard for these two. And the remains were later reburied in a town in Ghana known as Asan Manso. Mm -hmm. Asan Manso historically was a major slave route. Now, after all that was done, this was put, the door returned. Millions of Africans were taken out of this door and many other points on the west coast of Africa. And these were Africans forced out of their motherland. They never returned home. But they remain the bones that were returned on the 1st of August, 1998, symbolically broke that barrier. That's right. So this very same door, of no return. it is now a gateway back to the motherland Africa. So to our brothers and sisters in the diaspora everywhere, all we are saying is a Papa, welcome home yes. to the motherland. And uh, one thing uh, with the communities along the shores of Ghana is you find a lot of families with European names. Names. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, English names, Dutch names, Danish names. Mm -hmm. You know. 
uh, and it's unfortunate. Uh, these Europeans, you know, the mental slavery. Yes. They, 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 they tried as much as possible to make us basically hate ourselves, yes. anything about our, our culture, blackness. our names, our mm -hmm. language. So some of us, I don't know if it still happens, but some of us were whipped in school for speaking our local language, our mother tongue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, call it vernacular. The same thing in Jamaica. Oh, they tell you, don't Christ. speak Patois, speak English. <laughs> Queen's English. <laughs> Fire! The soldiers who worked in the slave trade, they lived down there. Okay. That used to be the barracks or the garrison mm -hmm. for their soldiers. Now an African market. Yes. Uh, the Europeans built about 40 of these structures all along the shores of West Africa. But more than 90% of them were built on the shores of Ghana. You know, close to 30 structures. Currently, we only have 17 preserved ones. Three of them we classify as slave castle. That is Cape Coast, the Elmina, and there's one in Accra, the Osuzu. And the other 14 are slave forts because they are smaller than these structures. So what one will ask, why were a lot of these structures built along the shores of, of Ghana? Yes. Why not on the shores of Benin? Or Togo. Nigeria, Togo. They were taking Africa from there as well. Right. But on the shores of Ghana, apart from you know taking our people, the humans, they were getting gold in abundance. So the gold we had was one thing. Of you know, when the Portuguese came, had they not they knew there was gold in West Africa. They knew. They knew about mm -hmm. Mansa Musa and all that. Mansa Musa, of course. They knew there was gold. Man on Earth. Yeah. But they didn't know exactly where, where, the where it was buried or where it was. was. Yes. And I mean, those days, they, our kings, you know, they, they sh the royals, I mean, they dressed with the gold yes. bracelet and all that. Yes. So Sit on a golden stool. Exactly. Yeah. So when the Portuguese had, the Portuguese not. They had been to Guinea before they came to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Had they not seen the gold, they probably would have moved on. Who knows where they could have ended? Right. So the gold was what made these Europeans stay. Mm -hmm. Before you know, I think the only Europeans who did not come to the shores of Ghana, of Ghana, was the Spanish. That's it. That was it. Apart from the, the Germans were here, all of them. The yeah. Spanish, Spanish, because they were in Mexico, there was gold. Yes. So they didn't want to come and compete right. with anyone here. I get it. Churches. Uh, far there where the cross is the Catholic, they were the first to come. And uh, right here is the Anglican. And across the street there is the Methodist church. One the white building is the green roof. The, the, the green roof. To the left there, that white building you said is something else. The fort. The fort. Yeah, the fort. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing with these churches is they all started from these slave castles. So you could say Christianity, as was brought by these Europeans, mm -hmm. started in the slave castle. The first churches were on top of dungeons and punishment cells. Atlantic slave trade by law has been abolished. abolished. But slavery is still going on. It is. Human trafficking has not stopped. It hasn't stopped. It's still going on. We cannot change or reverse what happened and we should never forget what happened. But we have to pass it on and on to you know, generations and generations. Uh, but also we have to learn. That's right. We have to do our best fight against modern slavery in our forms. Yes. 
and make the world a better and a safer place, not only for us and the kids, but also the unborn generations. So that the message from the chiefs and people, Ghana, is Kali Aswa. Yeah, just thanks family. We just leaving the tour. I hope you enjoyed it all. Of course, we're here at Word, Sound and Power bringing you cultural, cultural information to uplift the mind, body and soul. We give thanks for your patronage. We would love for you to share this video with a friend. Also, please subscribe. Also, push the like button and the notification button so we continue to bring you quality cultural information from the motherland. One love, fam. So put it in your meditation